Welcome to FO Talks, uh, deep dives into the issues behind the news. My name's Claire and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Um, this is one of the new talks brought to you by Fair Observer. Fair Observer is a platform for citizen journalism with contributors from around the world. We have two and a half thousand contributors from over 90 different countries and we would love you to join the conversation. So please sign up to our newsletter, subscribe to our channel, follow us on social media and you can write or publish with us too. So without further ado, I just want to say thank you and welcome to our speaker today. His name is Dr. Ishtiak Ahmed, and he is uh, enlightening us on Jinnah and the making of contemporary Pakistan. Dr. Ahmed is Professor Emeritus of Political Sciences at Stockholm University and has written many books. And the latest one is entitled Jinnah, His Successes, Failures and Role in History, and it's creating an earthquake in political and academic circles, even though it hasn't yet hit the shelves. So thank you, Professor, and welcome to FO Talks. Thank you very much, uh, Claire Price. I consider myself privileged okay, to uh, present the findings of my book on Jena. The title given me the challenge with Jena's vision of Pakistan, I think is a daunting one. Uh, the reason is that Jena's genius was expended in convincing uh, the British that a partitioned India is in their interest. This is one. Jena faced a formidable adversary, enemy if you want to call, and that was the Indian National Congress, which wanted a united India, arguing that all Indians were part of one nation. And they based their theory of nationalism on territoriality. Jinnah became the advocate, the champion of Pakistan uh, from 1940 onwards. He would not compromise on any other solution to the future of India without the British. And in order to justify, to legitimate, to uh, the demand for Pakistan, which would entail the partition of India into at least two states, he had to find all those arguments which separated uh, Hindus and Muslims as two not only separate nations, but hostile nations who had no future together. And in doing that, he then, being a famous lawyer, used all arguments which would substantiate, augment, supplement his claims that the Muslims were a separate and distinct nation. So my theory is, and my finding in the book is, that Jinnah's greatest triumph, his greatest achievement was to bring about the division of India. And in doing so, he gave all sort of conflicting promises uh, on the one hand to the British, uh, had to make some assurances to the Indian National Congress, but primarily to the Indian Muslim community, which was a thousand years old, even older. And they were dispersed all over India, but concentrated in the Northeast and Northwest. Within the Muslim community, there was a very strong opposition to any division of Muslims uh, as a result of the partition of India, because that would weaken the Muslim community and it would defeat the purpose of Islam, which is universal, which is always to strengthen Muslims rather than to separate them from one another. So within the Muslim community, he faced, uh, you know, a big challenge. And it came from people who knew their Islam very well. The Indian National Congress till the very end held fast to the demand that India 
should remain united and that the central government of india should have should be effective the british were in the middle the final decision would rest with them and the fact is that until about may 1947 the dominant view uh, among the british was that a united india means a united indian army you know the united india army was 2.5 million during world war 2 it had fought for great britain during world war 1 and as, as well as in the second world war and uh, about 38 to 42% of uh, the soldiers the troops were muslim whereas the muslim percentage of the indian population was 25% close to 25% so the muslims were overrepresented in the military so one argument was that to divide india would mean to divide the indian army and that would be an invitation to soviet russia uh to move towards the warm waters in the south for the british this had been a bug bear from 1833 onwards and i think after the russian revolution this became this multiplied this fear that the russians are coming uh, so pakistan was conceded at the very end you know in may 1947 we find evidence that the british uh, were convinced that a uni- that a divided india means that pakistan uh, would be a loyal ally whereas india with its anti imperialism and its socialist left leaning leadership may want to remain independent or may even align themselves with the soviet union so pakistan was created in great haste and the and the partition of india as we all know uh caused at least the death of 1 million hindus muslims and sikhs and it uprooted or forced people out of their homes to the tune of 14 to 15 million it is the greatest forced migration in peace time ever in history so the partition itself engulfed the people leaving them burnt and bleeding and so you find india and pakistan at loggerheads ever since you know they have disputes over territory they have disputes over uh, the division of the assets of assets of the british colonial state and so on and so forth but more importantly and i think this is what uh, you maybe want to know more about regarding the findings of the book once pakistan was created jinnah had no consistent or coherent vision about pakistan you know to the section of the ulama he had promised that the sharia will be the law of the land and as you know the islamic law sharia is all embracing uh to the more liberal you know westernized pakistanis or muslims he had said that we will have a modern national state a muslim democracy a spiritual democracy so on and so forth uh so once pakistan comes into being while jena was alive and you know he died on the 11th of september 1948 uh his legacy has been disputed among those who then inherited the mantle of power and among the people i would say that there have been two main opinions one is that jinnah stood for a modern progressive uh national state a democracy in which uh, the sharia would be the source of inspiration and uh, all laws will be in consonance with uh, the quran and sunnah this is the wording the second position was that jinnah had pledged to the ulama Uh, that pakistan will be an islamic state and historically uh, the state is inseparable from uh, the history of islam and therefore 
if you want to create true justice justice ordained by god you have to apply the sharia in a total form so these have been the two main positions and this has been contested uh, over the years a third position latches on to one solitary speech of jinnah on the 11th of august 1947 in which he suddenly you know while addressing the pakistan the members of the pakistan constituent assembly which were going to uh, which were going to uh, uh, frame the pakistan constitution he had omitted islam altogether and had gone off in a in a very liberal direction very secular direction saying that in the great state of pakistan hindus will cease to be hindus and muslims will cease to be muslims not in a religious sense because that's a matter of personal faith but as citizens of the state the thing is that this speech doesn't have any backing thereafter what we find is evidence of jina going back to islam and sharia and making pledges once again that the pakistan constitution will be islamic that the sharia will be the source of law and so you see uh, pakistan since then has been unable to reach consensus on uh, what sort of a state jina wanted the second thing which uh, is about Pak- is about jina's legacy is that he be- he decided to become the governor general of pakistan instead of the prime minister one argument is that he didn't want mount batten to be the governor general of pakistan as well he didn't trust him well that can be discussed but let's agree that that was a genuine fear he could have appointed any other you know elderly muslim pakistani as uh, governor general and himself become the prime minister and thus strengthen the constitutional uh, theory you know this is how constitutionalism operates in practice but he became the all powerful governor general who would preside over the cabinet meetings he made all the important decisions and the prime minister liaquat ali khan sat among the ministers and ended up signing all the decisions which had been taken and during jinnah's time we find uh, you know he acquired powers which even the viceroy of india never had he dismissed an elected government in the northwest frontier province two weeks after pakistan came into being another government which was of the muslim league but the chief minister of sindh mr ayub khodu was opposed to karachi being allotted uh, being declared a federal territory he thought that it was the main city of sindh and should remain in sindh so he was dismissed then the third thing he did which was also very controversial was to go to uh dhaka bengal east pakistan and they declared that urdu will be the national language of pakistan whereas uh, the people in pakistan whose mother tongue was urdu was 3 4% in 1947 i can understand that muslims in generally understood urdu but not in bengal uh, so i think this is where the legacy of jina is almost impossible to decipher because my main argument is that jina was entirely you know occupied preoccupied with getting uh, uh, pakistan as a separate state outside india and he succeeded in that but in his success there is the problem that within the muslim community the sectarian divisions say, later on came up sub sectarian divisions also came to haunt pakistan so you find all these terrorisms <clears throat> conducted by sectarian militias and that's the tragedy of pakistan one final thing because constitutionalism was not strengthened you find that the military took over the reins of power uh, way back and now uh, in my book pakistan the garrison state i concluded that the pakistan military or rather the pakistan army exercises veto powers over pakistan's domestic policy and foreign policy so uh, 
civilian supremacy is uh, conspicuous by its absence. I think I will end here, and uh, I would welcome questions from the listeners. Professor, thank you so much. Um, just in the interest of getting a lot of questions to you in a limited time, I'm going to be summarizing the questions that people have typed up in the chat box. So just in terms of our listeners there, please do type in your questions now, um, as opposed to asking them directly. Um, so let's just go to some of the questions that have already been uh, prompted by your... So do that question. Sorry, if I can ask that everybody mutes their microphone for the time being, and I'm going to be asking the questions. Um, so this is one actually from Ossal Singh, who, as you know, is the editor-in-chief of Fair Observer. And uh, what he wants to know is, uh, well, he says, Jinnah was incredibly secular. He married a Parsi woman. He wore his Savile Row suit, um, and he lived in London for many years. What made him, um, what made Muslims... Uh, accept him as their leader. Dr. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, you'll just have to unmute yourself, I'm afraid, since I've just muted everybody. I think this is uh, the million dollar question everybody asks. It's so easy to ask that question. Let me, in a rhetorical manner, I'm not making a comparison, say that Adolf Hitler, you know, was a vegetarian. And he found relaxation by surrounding himself with uh, sheep, lambs, goats, uh, and other such, you know, innocuous animals. And if one were just to look at his private life, one could, one would be, you know, one would, one could conclude that he must be a very peaceful person. I don't think personal lifestyles really matter. One can be uh, very secular in one's personal life, but one can be very communal. You know, the founders of Israel were very secular in their personal lives. But Zionism as an ideology is communal, and this declare Israel as a, a Jewish state. The very description of Israel says that it's a communal state. It's a democracy for Jews, no doubt. But we also know that it is oppression for the Arabs under occupation. So I think I, I that's my uh, response to Atul uh, Singh. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, another one really, which is questioning his uh, Jinnah's motivations, this comes from Sadat Noor. And uh, he says, what possibly could have been going on is in Jinnah's mind uh, when he accepted Pakistan as two separate land masses divided by thousands of kilometers of a hostile nation? Um, didn't he or his advisors perhaps think that was a bad idea? Um, how could he, be so naive? And was he perhaps part of a conspiracy um, rather than being naive? What's your view on that? Well, there's different levels of this question. One is that Jinnah wanted a partitioned India on the basis of religion, that the Northeast and the Northwest be separated from the rest of India, because that is where the Muslims were uh, concentrated and were in a majority. And on such a basis, he then wanted the whole of Punjab and Bengal to be given to Pakistan. The Indian National Congress countered this demand or this position and was supported by the six, or rather the six were the first to demand this, and the Congress in the end uh, threw their full weight behind this uh, counter argument that if India is to be partitioned on the basis of uh, contiguous Muslim, non-Muslim, regions, then Punjab and Bengal should also be partitioned on a similar basis. So in the end, Jinnah had to reconcile, and he famously called it a moth hit in Pakistan. You know, substantial portions of Punjab and Bengal were taken and given to India. But this was an unassailable argument from the Indian National Congress, that if Hindus and Muslims were not a nation because of their religion, this should apply then everywhere. And so these two provinces were partitioned and Pakistan ended up with having an impossible border to defend. You know, most of Pakistan's defense was uh, uh, concentrated on West Pakistan. And East Pakistan really never had any proper defense, any military or so. 
And uh, not only that, the border was, which was drawn finally by the Red Cliff Award was on the neck of Pakistan's biggest city at that time, Lahore, only 18 kilometers away. Then other major cities or uh, towns like uh, Sialkot was 20 kilometers, Gujranwala, Gujarat, these are two other main towns of those times, huh? were less than 30 kilometers. The only uh, city worth the name 300,000 was Karachi, uh, you know, on the coast. Uh, but otherwise, Pakistan was a very vulnerable state. And that is why I've argued that Pakistan from day one was a state, uh, you know, fearful of foreign aggression. And most of its resources have been spent on, on uh, arming itself. The arms race with India is partly because in a land war, Pakistan is at a great disadvantage. It's only when they got nuclear powers that I think they can now put a stop to it and go for peace and development. But until that was attained, Pakistan was in a very vulnerable situation. It still is in an all out war. Uh, so that's the reason Jinnah had no choice. There is an English saying, if I remember it correctly, what is good for the goose is good for the gander. So if you demand the partition of India on the basis of religion, what stops the other side for saying then let's separate the non-Muslim majority districts of Punjab and Bengal and give them to India? There was no argument and Jinnah had to accept it. In the end, he desperately wanted a, a corridor a uh, narrow corridor, you know, going all the way from one part of Pakistan to the other. Everybody knew that this was just, uh, you know, an argument he just put forward, but it had no weight whatsoever. So it's not that he obviously wanted that, but it was just real politic he had to accept. No, if you want Pakistan, it has to be in the northeast and northwest. Okay. So already this was going, first of all, Pakistan originally was a generic name meant for several Muslim states. Towards the end, it was decided there will be a Western Pakistan and an Eastern Pakistan. But then finally, in April 1947, it was decided that Eastern Bengal, which is Muslim Bengal, will join Pakistan. So what we got finally as Pakistan is a very late arrival. The very decision to partition India is 3rd of June, 1947. This was a very hurried partition and the British really didn't have proper preparation. That is why so much riots and pogroms and rapes took place, you know. Uh, in my book on the Punjab partition, I've given great details because most of the horrors were uh, experienced by the people of Punjab. Okay, um, you raised quite a few different issues in that answer. Um, you did touch upon uh, nuclear weapons. So if we just take it to sort of contemporary Pakistan, uh, I'm just trying to find the question here. Um, it's really just asking, well, why did India and Pakistan become nuclear powers? Um, how did that come about? Isn't that today's biggest threat? Now, you know, this, the way the world politics is, you know, the United States acquired nuclear weapons and then did the Soviet, Soviet Union. China did it because uh, the United States and the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. When China had, India felt threatened. So when India acquired the weapons, Pakistan wanted to have the same. So this is the built-in character of uh, states feeling threatened and therefore believing that nuclear weapons may be guaranteed their survival. I think it's a pathetic situation, but so is the case. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just having a little look on any other uh, comments that I can put to you here. Um, Esther Esh has written, um, I always hope and believe that if not in my lifetime, then sometime in the future, that India, Pakistan and Bangladesh will reunite. Um, what are your thoughts on that, the future of those countries? You know, this is something which I've always uh, had reservations about. 
I think before they unite, if they unite at all, what we must insist upon is that they establish normal relations, peaceful relations, uh, you know, promote trade, uh, people coming and going. Uh, because, you know, neither India wants Pakistan to return, nor do Pakistanis want to be a part of India. And I don't think Bangladesh either. History has del delivered its verdict. But, you know, like the European Union, now the British have left, so it's not a good argument talking to somebody in London. But honestly, peace in Europe has been ensured by the European Union, where you have all the sovereign states, and yet people can move from one end to another, even settle there, uh, go to school and college and so on. That sort of, uh, you know, future for this region is the best. In the long run, the whole world should unite. Why should there be any borders at all? Sure. But what is possible is, I think Pakistan is going to be the main gainer if it were to have good relations with India. I have argued over and over again that if Pakistan were to have normal good relations with India, they don't even have to spend anything and charge all the goods traveling from uh, uh, on this road from Vaga all the way to Central Asia and Europe of Indian goods, uh, the levies and the taxes. And then one can insist on having joint ventures together. So Pakistan should use its geostrategic position uh, in a lucrative manner, have good relations with China, have good relations with India, and why not with the United States? I mean, this is the art that you protect your self-interest, your national uh, identity and sovereignty, and yet have good relations with people in the neighborhood and with the world powers. Pakistan has to understand that international law applies. It cannot be used as the base for so-called non-state uh, terrorist actors. You know That has to end. Pakistan must act responsibly, and so must India, I must say. On both sides, there is a lot of jingoism and chauvinism, and I think it is self-defeating. These are poverty-stricken, illiteracy-ridden societies. I consider it very shameful that the elites in, on both sides are in this sort of belligerent, bellicose mood all the time. It serves nobody. It does nobody any good. Right. There's a, a question here I'm going to put to you from Yashwant, who's written, if uh, Mr. Jinnah revisited Pakistan today, um, what would he be able to relate to in terms of what he created? Um, a fairly long question here, but what exactly went wrong and what would he be able to relate to in terms of his legacy? I think he would regret that uh, Pakistan didn't become uh, some sort of a functioning, coherent uh, Muslim state, respect to of the minorities. You know, all along, when he gave pledges to the Islamists or to the liberals, he would insist that women should be treated well, that uh, the minorities should be taken care of according to ideal Islamic justice. Now, when you have to apply these principles, well, the Islamic legacy has its own way. And there is a Quranic verse uh, which says that Jews, Christians, and Sabians can live among Muslims by paying the jizya. Now, of course, that time is gone. But that principle has then been, uh, you know, through analogy applied to India uh, after the Arabs conquered Sindh. And uh, the ruling given was that even Hindus believed in the same God. So as long as uh, they pay the jizya, which is protection tax, they can live in peace among Muslims. Now, of course, that era is gone of conquest and charging jizya and so on. So I think Pakistan can be a state like Israel, you know, some sort of uh, democracy, at least for the last, uh, vast majority of people. And the minorities should be given all religious freedoms they deserve. Uh, on the other hand, you have all those who want it to be an Islamic state, and that's a very strong lobby. 
so uh, jenna would be um, very surprised maybe shocked disappointed but he would realize that it is all his doing if you invoke religion and if you mobilize people in the name of religion pakistan ka matlab kya la ilaha illallah this is the slogan which was chanted throughout the punjab you know from where i come and i know the people i met the people who chanted this so if that is the basis of pakistan it has to be some sort of a state with islam playing a central role how central and how substantial is a different matter pakistan is not meant to be a secular state if the pakistanis do make it a secular state i would be very pleased um you mentioned obviously secular states and religion there we've got a question from dr uh, amar who says he's an assistant professor in bihar university in india he says mm-hmm. so does democracy secularism secularism um is democracy and secularism compatible with a religious uh, state and if not then why don't current leaders understand that well i in my doctoral thesis this is what i established that uh, secularism democracy and islam cannot be combined in one workable formula and if we were to take away islam and bring in hinduism or let's say christianity the result would be the same so religion uh, you know has its own way of looking at the world it has its own theory of knowledge epistemology as we call it it has its own theory of uh, what being a social being is and uh, you know uh, and so it's not the same as a rational being which is the basis of a liberal democracy where evidence science and increasing knowledge is the basis for making laws and reforming society so no i'm sorry i think any religion uh, being combined to secularism and democracy defeats the whole purpose you it is i mean it is neither fish nor fowl yeah okay i think we'll take just maybe one more question and uh well we did start late we'll do a few more questions and then we'll wrap up yes i'm i'm very happy to we did start a bit late yeah. um yeah. let's find something that is uh taking us on a little bit um or maybe even taking us back to history since we did sort of skirt off that a little bit quickly um a few yes. people have asked about jinnah's relationship or relations rather with with gandhi um what was their relationship like was could you say that gandhi succeeded where jinnah failed how would you assess their relationship you know that's a major portion of the my study on jinnah i think jinnah felt uh, deprived of what he believed was the rightful leadership of all indians because he was senior to gandhi in terms of joining the indian national congress Gandhi returned from South Africa in 1915 Jena joined the Congress in 1906 and had established himself as a leader uh, but then Gandhi comes and uh, over time within 3 uh, 4 years under Gandhi the Congress becomes a mass movement it it is radicalized and Jena was not one who believed in uh, mass uh, you know opposition Uh, to british rule he wanted to go gradually and to work towards reforms and as it so happened uh, the whole indian freedom movement radicalized and uh, uh, G- uh, jena then left the congress in 1920 and for several years he had to struggle to become the leader of the muslims because within the uh, muslim community there were many other competitors for the leadership of muslims and finally he established his hold in 1937 and then he went on to demand pakistan so he always had a very deep grudge against gandhi and i think till the end he never uh, truly understood that uh, times had changed the times of the type of politics which had taken place after 1920 were radical and it is he who then sort of uh, left it 
and became the leader of a minority uh, community. So, I mean, the relations were always strained from 1920 onwards. Actually, from 1915, some people say, I go through the whole, uh, you know, the, all the events showing what happened, but not good. Jinnah believed that he was, he should have been the leader. He was gifted. He was so, he was so, and Gandhi stole the leadership from him, which is actually not true, I think. Uh, but I mean, this is how he felt. And without that feeling, he would not go for a demand for a separate state. You need to motivate yourself that you are right. So in his own mind, he was totally convinced that uh, he had been dealt um, a false hand, you know, and, and he, and so, well, why not then Pakistan to prove that he was no less a leader than Gandhi? I'm sure he felt that way. And uh, one person's just asked, um, Mordit Jain has just asked, and is Jinnah revered in Pakistan today? Um, how, how is he viewed? Well, you know, that's another interesting uh, aspect of this whole discussion. He has been, uh, his image has been haloed, you know, he's like a saint. The way people write to, about him and talk about him, uh, it's as if they're discussing some saint, some uh, person free of all sin and so on and so forth. So there is no independent discussion on Jinnah. It's all praise and that's all. And if you do not agree, then you are in trouble or at least you are ostracized academically. Well, that obviously brings us to you, Professor, because your book challenges this myth. Um, some people are asking, can, you, can we remind them the name of your book? And it's, um, well, maybe you can yeah. remind us the name and, and just tell us what reception you've had, particularly in Pakistan. Yes. Well, the title of the book is Jinnah, His Successes, Failures and Role in History. This is Penguin India publishing it 11th of September, which is uh, the death anniversary of Jinnah. This is when they are uh, releasing it. Okay. But already from the 4th onwards, they are sending it through post to all those who have prepaid uh, for the book. And, uh, you know, this book excited a lot of attention, both in India and Pakistan. And very surprisingly, I've been interviewed by young Pakistanis, very bold, very learned, who have gone through all my books. And we have had long sessions and all those uh, interviews are uh, on YouTube and in the public. So there is no doubt there is a lot of interest in this book because it is completely different from what we have been told. It's respectful of, respectful of, of his uh, role as a leader, but it is critical of his politics and, uh, and so on and so forth. That he was a great leader cannot be denied, but was his politics the right one for even Muslims? I, I have my uh, reservations. And have you been ostracized? You mentioned that uh, it's difficult to speak out against this myth. Have you found well, it? First of all, I live in Sweden and that's where I was a professor. But from 2013 onwards, every winter I would go and teach two years at Lums, which is a famous place in Lahore. And then even the, the even more famous historical place, Government College University uh, for five years. And in my class, I said these things, which I was still working on. And this was something new for my students and for my colleagues. But, uh, you know, my views elicited a lot of interest. So actually, Pakistanis are very curious. And the state narrative has been so one-sided, lacking any nuance, lacking any, uh, you know, uh, uh, scope for any critical reviews of, of Jinnah's politics, that all sorts of people are eager to uh, read this book. Of course, some people have gone out and accused me of so many things that I'm an Indian agent and, you know, one lives with this, such 
sort of nonsense because either you pack up and leave or you remain in the public and say what you think uh, is right and what is the truth i always say uh, truth is god god is not truth because everybody has his own god and his own truth but truth is an independent thing and once you are uh, you know pursuing what the truth is you feel the strength that you want to tell the world uh, things which they have not been uh, informed about oh just the last perhaps the last couple of questions faisal anwar has asked you so in your view is pakistan a failed state um and if i can ask my own question well what's your view perhaps of the future of pakistan is it a future? okay well failed state yes in 1971 it broke up into two so already failed in that sense now we have only west pakistan but it's not a failed state in the sense that Uh, there is a complete breakdown of law and order people go to office they do their job come back feed their families so there is a regular reproduction on a daily basis of the of the livelihood of people you know there are laws which apply there is a lot of corruption but i mean that's a different thing but it's definitely a failed democracy it's neither an islamic state nor is it a democracy uh it's what i have called as a garrison state in which everybody fears that india is out to undo us and i think this is greatly exaggerated because the four wars with which we have had with india three were directly initiated by pakistan and in the fourth uh i think india at one point took advantage of pakistan's own civil war in east pakistan and then kargil once again there was a peace effort and we sabotaged it so i mean india is the stronger economically the more powerful nation no doubt but i don't think they are out to destroy pakistan uh in pakistan for them everything which goes wrong is a doing of india or let's say israel or then united states you know we have a lot of conspiracy theories up our sleeves uh of course in india this current government is also very hostile and the indian media is also very hostile so it only feeds the pakistani uh, narrative of of an indian ill will and uh, bad intentions it's, it's 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 very pathetic a few people uh, have picked up on this obviously the the relationship between india and pakistan and asked well is that why pakistan is relying so much on china and is it going to suffer as a result of that relationship with china yes i think pakistan is going to suffer a lot if it relies only on china because china will pursue its own global interests of which pakistan plays an important role and i've seen that you know master plan at it at it includes burma and movement of things even from there and that means going through india so at some stage even the chinese have india included in their plans but right now you know it this is a very tension ridden area with china and in, uh, iran going together the indians going towards uh, the united states and pakistan uh declaring even more vociferously that our friendship with china is higher than all the mountains and deeper than all the oceans you know we uh, use poetic languages and superlatives uh, but actually i don't think that is good for pakistan pakistan should have good relations with all neighbors and use them to its own advantage pakistan needs badly to educate its people to establish industry you know pakistan in the 60s had a pulsating vibrant textile industry and people from singapore south korea and taiwan came uh, to study the pakistan developmental plans and see how they have made use of the of that idea and uh, pakistan is the only state that i know of which instead of continuing to industrialize has deindustrialized uh, bangladesh which has it doesn't grow cotton is has a uh, you know a very uh, successful textile industry 
and textile means you know cotton things mostly pakistan's own textile industry is reduced to a small portion we don't have uh, you know electricity the power to generate you know to to make things function the only things we buy are made in china and i think one country alone you know getting the whole market is not good economics let others come in india for example and let's see which one is cheaper and better and people buy things got for their own to their own advantage i think pakistan's problem is its ideological fixation it can't fix its priorities in a rational manner and it does nobody any uh, good in pakistan it does pakistan as a whole a great of a great deal of harm i think okay it's i'm so sad to say this Professor, we, I think, are going to have to leave it there, but I just want to say a huge thank you to you and also to our listeners who've asked so many questions. We've only got really through a very small percentage of all these questions that people are asking. Um, so uh, let, me, let me take this opportunity to thank you, Atul Singh and the team of Fair Observer and all these listeners and those who post the questions. I do hope I have been able to respond in some measure to their concerns but i would urge them to read my book it's 808 pages and i worked my guts out as i always do with all my books and they won't be disappointed this is an entirely different way of studying a political leader you know i'm not a historian in that narrow sense where you go only after you know uh, government documents i've gone through his speeches and my argument is that jinnah may be the creator of an idea but once the idea becomes mass consciousness jinnah had no power to recall those ideas they are then part of the national psyche so i mean that's another way of looking at the power of ideas and the limitations of leaders who create ideas i don't think from plato onward somebody has done that systematically No. What they have done is shown the power of ideas. Absolutely. I have said the power of ideas bind those who create those ideas. Thank you, Professor. And we we, we may be cut off in just a moment, so let me just um, do a little plug for Fair Observer, if I may. So, um, can I just ask people? Obviously, do please read the uh, professor's book, but also you can join in the conversation on Fair Observer. You can sign up to our newsletter, subscribe to our channel, follow us on social media. and uh, you can also write for us as well you can publish with us so please do join in the conversation um and become a fair observer thank you very much for your time today thank you